Jack the Giant Killer. In the reign of King Arthur, there lived in the county of Cornwall, near the land's end of England, a wealthy farmer who had only one son called Jack. He was brisk and of a ready, lively wit, so that whatever he could not perform by force and strength, he did by his quick wit and cleverness. Never was any person heard of that could worst him, and he very often baffled wise men by his sharp and ready invention. In those days, the Mount of Cornwall was kept by a huge and monstrous giant of eighteen feet in height and about three yards in girth of a fierce and grim face, the terror of all the towns and villages near. He lived in a cave in the midst of the mount, and would not suffer anyone else to live near him. His food was other men's cattle, which often became his prey. For whensoever he wanted food, he would wade over to the mainland, where he would furnish himself with whatever came in his way. The good folk at his approach forsook their homes while he seized on their cattle, making nothing of carrying half a dozen oxen on his back at a time. And as for their sheep and hogs, he would tie them round his waist like a bunch of bandoliers. This course he had followed for many years, so that all Cornwall had been come through his robberies. One day, Jack, happening to be present at the town hall, when the magistrates were sitting in council about the giant, asked what reward would be given to the person who destroyed him. The giant's treasure, they said, was the reward. Quoth Jack, then let me undertake it. So he took a horn, shovel, and pickaxe, and went over to the mount in the beginning of a dark winter's evening, when he fell to work, and before morning had dug a pit twenty-two feet deep, and nearly as broad, covering it over with long sticks and straw. Then, strewing a little mold upon it, it appeared like plain ground. This done, Jack placed himself on the contrary side of the pit, farthest from the giant's lodging, and, just at the break of day, he put the horn to his mouth and blew. Tantivy, tantivy! The unexpected noise aroused the giant, who rushed from his cave, crying, You old villain! Are you come here to disturb my rest? You shall pay dearly for this. Satisfaction I will have, and this it shall be. I will take you whole and broil you for breakfast. He had no sooner uttered this than tumbling into the pit, he made the very foundations of the mount to shake. Oh, giant, quoth Jack, where are you now? Oh, faith, are you gotten now into Lob's Pound, where I will surely plague you for your wicked words? What do you think now of broiling me for your breakfast? Will no other diet serve you but poor Jack? Thus having teased the giant for a while, he gave him a most weighty knock with his pickaxe on the very crown of his head 
and killed him on the spot. This done, Jack filled up the pit with earth and went to search the cave, which he found contained much treasure. When the magistrates heard of this, they said he should henceforth be called Jack the Giant Killer and gave him a sword and an embroidered belt on which were written these words in letters of gold. Here's the right valiant Cornish man who slew the giant Cormelian. The news of Jack's victory spread over all the west of England so that another giant named Blunderbore, hearing of it, vowed to be revenged on the little hero, if ever it was his fortune to light on him. This giant was the lord of an enchanted castle, standing in the midst of a lonesome wood. Now, Jack, about four months afterwards, walking near his wood in his journey to Wales, being weary, seated himself near a pleasant fountain and fell fast asleep. While he was enjoying his repose, the giant, coming for water, there found him and knew him to be the fair-famed Jack by the lines written on the belt. Without ado, he took Jack on his shoulders and carried him towards his enchanted castle. Now, as they passed through a thicket, the rustling of the boughs awakened Jack, who was strangely surprised to find himself in the clutches of the giant. His terror was not yet begun, for on entering the castle, he saw the ground strewn with human bones, the giant telling him his own would ere long increase them. After this, the giant locked poor Jack in an immense chamber, leaving him there while he went to fetch another giant living in the same wood, to help him to put an end to Jack. While he was gone, dreadful shrieks and cries affrighted Jack, especially a voice which said many times, Do what you can to get away, or you'll become the giant's prey. He's gone to fetch his brother, who will kill, likewise devour you too. This dreadful noise had almost distracted Jack, who, going to a window, beheld far off the two giants coming towards the castle. Now, quoth Jack to himself, my death or my escape is at hand. Now there were strong cords in a corner of the room in which Jack was, and two of these he took and made a strong noose at the end. And while the giants were unlocking the iron gate of the castle, he threw the ropes over each of their heads, then drawing the other end across the beam, and pulling with all his might, he throttled them. Then, seeing they were black in the face, and sliding down the rope, he came to their heads, when they could not defend themselves, and, drawing his sword, slew them both. Then, taking the giant's keys and unlocking the rooms, he found three fair ladies, tied by the hair of their heads, almost starved to death. Sweet ladies, quoth Jack, I have killed this monster and his brutish brother and set you free. Just said he gave them the keys and so went on his journey to Wales. Having but little money, Jack found it well to make the best of his way by travelling as fast he could, but, losing his road, he was benighted and could not get a place to rest in, until, coming into a narrow valley, he found a large house and, by reason of his present needs, took courage to knock at the gate. But what was his surprise when there came forth a monstrous giant with two heads. 
yet he did not appear so fiery as the others were, for he was a Welsh giant, and what he did was by private and secret malice under the false show of friendship. Jack, having told his state to the giant, was shown into a bedroom, where, in the dead of night, he heard his host in another room muttering these words. Though you lodge with me this night, you shall not see the morning light. My club shall dash your brains Right. Sayest thou so, quoth Jack, that is like one of your Welsh tricks, yet I hope to be cunning enough for you. Then, getting out of bed, he laid a billet of wood in the bed in his steed, and hid himself in a corner of the room. At the dead time of the night, in came the Welsh giant, who struck several heavy blows on the bed with his club, thinking he had broken every bone in Jack's skin. The next morning, Jack, laughing in his sleeve, gave him hearty thanks for his night's lodging. How have you rested? quoth the giant. Did you not feel anything in the night? No, quoth Jack. Nothing but a rat, which gave me two or three slaps with her tail. With that, greatly wondering, the giant led Jack to breakfast, bringing him a bowl containing four gallons of hasty pudding. Being loath to let the giant think it too much for him, Jack put a large leather bag under his loose coat in such a way that he could convey the pudding into it without it being seen. Then Jack, telling the giant he would show him a trick, taking a knife, Jack ripped open the bag, and out came all the hasty pudding. Whereupon, saying, Odd splutters, her can do that trick herself, the monster took the knife and, ripping open his body, fell down dead. Now it fell in these days that King Arthur's only son begged his father to give him a large sum of money in order that he might go and seek his fortune in the country of Wales, where lived a beautiful lady possessed with seven evil spirits. The king did his best to persuade his son from it, but in vain. So at last granted the request, and the prince set out with two horses, one loaded with money, the other for himself to ride upon. Now, after several days' travel, he came to a market town in Wales, where he beheld a vast crowd of people gathered together. The prince asked the reason of it, and was told that they had arrested a corpse for several large sums of money, which the dead man owed when he died. The prince replied that it was a pity creditors should be so cruel, and said, Go bury the dead, and let his creditors come to my lodging, and there their debts shall be paid. So they came, but in such great numbers that before the night, he had almost left himself moneyless. Now Jack the Giant Killer, coming that way, was so taken with the generosity of the prince that he wished to be his servant. This being agreed upon, the next morning they set forward on their journey together. When they were riding out of the town, an old woman called after the prince, saying, He has owed me two pence these seven years. Pray, pay me as well as the rest. Putting his hand to his pocket, the prince gave the woman all he had left, so that after their day's refreshment, which cost what small amount Jack had by him, they were without a penny between them. When the sun began to grow low, 
the king's son said, Jack, since we have no money, where can we lodge this night? Jack replied, Master, we'll do well enough, for I have an uncle with three heads. He'll fight five hundred men in armor and make them fly before him. Alas, quoth the prince, what shall we do there? He'll certainly chop us up at a mournful. Nay, we are scarce enough to fill one of his hollow teeth. It is no matter for that quoth Jack. I myself will go before and prepare the way for you. Therefore, tarry and wait till I return. Jack then rode away full speed and coming to the gate of the castle, he knocked so loud that he made the hills around to echo. The giant roared out at this like thunder. Who's there? He was answered, None but your poor cousin Jack, quoth he. What news with my poor cousin Jack, he replied. Dear uncle, heavy news, God what? Prithee, quoth the giant, what heavy news can come to me? I am a giant with three heads, and besides, thou knowest I can fight five hundred men in armor and make them fly like chaff before the wind. Oh, but, quoth Jack, here's the king's son a-coming, with a thousand men in armor to kill you and destroy all that you have. Oh, cousin Jack, said the giant, this is heavy news indeed. I will immediately run and hide myself, and thou shalt lock, bolt, and bar me in, and keep the keys until the prince is gone. Having secured the giant, Jack fetched his master when they made themselves heartily merry whilst the poor giant lay trembling in a vault under the ground. Early in the morning, Jack furnished his master with a fresh supply of gold and silver and then set him three miles forward on his journey, at which time the prince was pretty well out of the smell of the giant. Jack then returned and let the giant out of the vault, who asked what he should give him for keeping the castle safe. Why, quoth Jack, I desire nothing but the old coat and cap, together with the old rusty sword and slippers which are at your bed's head. Quoth the giant, Thou shalt have them, and pray keep them for my sake for they are things of excellent use. The coat will keep you invisible. The cap will furnish you with knowledge. The sword cuts asunder whatever you strike, and the shoes are of extraordinary swiftness. These may be useful to you. Therefore, take them with all of my heart. Taking them, Jack thanked his uncle, and then, having overtaken his master, they quickly arrived at the house of the lady the prince sought, who, finding the prince to be a suitor, prepared a splendid banquet for him. After the feasting was done, she wiped his mouth with a handkerchief, saying, You must show me that handkerchief tomorrow morning, or else you will lose your head. With that, she put it in her bosom. The prince went to bed in great sorrow, but Jack's cap of knowledge taught him how it was to be got. In the middle of the night, she called upon her familiar spirit to carry her to Lucifer. But Jack put on his coat of darkness and shoes of swiftness and was there as soon as she. 
When she entered the place of the evil one, she gave the one handkerchief to old Lucifer, who laid it upon a shelf, whence Jack took it and brought it to his master, who showed it to the lady the next day, and so saved his life. On that day, she saluted the prince, telling him he must show her the lips tomorrow morning that she kissed last night, or lose his head. Ah, he replied, if you kiss none but mine, I will. That is neither here nor there, said she. But remember, if you do not, death's your portion. At midnight she went as before, and was angry with old Lucifer for letting the handkerchief go. But now, quoth she, I will be too hard for the king's son, for I will kiss thee, and he is to show me thy lips. Which she did, and Jack, who was standing by, cut off the devil's head and brought it under his invisible cloak to his master, who the next morning pulled it out by the horns before the lady. The enchantment thus broken, the evil spirit left her, and she appeared in all her beauty. They were married the next morning, and soon after went to the court of King Arthur, where Jack, for his many great deeds, was made one of the knights of the round table. Having been successful in all he did, Jack resolved not to remain idle, but to do what he could for the honor of his king and country, and begged King Arthur to fit him out with a horse and money to help him travel in search of strange and new adventures. For, said he, there are many giants yet living in the farthest part of Wales, to the great damage of your majesty's liege subjects. Wherefore, may it please you to encourage me, I do not doubt, but in a short time, to cut them off root and branch, and so rid all the realm of those giants and monsters of nature. When the king had heard this noble request, he furnished Jack with all he had need of, and Jack started on his pursuit, taking with him the cap of knowledge, sword of sharpness, shoes of swiftness, and invisible coat, the better to succeed in the dangerous adventures which now leaned before him. Jack travelled over vast hills and wonderful mountains, and on the third day he came to a large wood which he had no sooner entered than he heard the dreadful shrieks and cries. Casting his eyes round, he beheld with terror a huge giant dragging along a fair lady and a knight by the hair of their heads, with as much ease as if they had a pair of gloves. And at this sight, Jack shed tears of pity, then, getting off from his horse, he put on his invisible coat, and taking with him his sword of sharpness, at length, with a swinging stroke, cut off both the giant's legs below the knee, so that his fall made the trees to tremble. At this, the courteous knight and his fair lady, after returning Jack their hearty thanks, invited him home, there to refresh his strength after the battle and receive some ample reward for his good services. But Jack vowed he would not rest until he had found out the giant's den. The knight, hearing this, was very sorrowful, and replied, Noble stranger, it is too much to run a second risk. This monster lived in a den under yonder mountain, with a brother more fierce and fiery than himself. Therefore, if you should go thither and perish in the attempt, 
it would be a heartbreaking to me and my lady. Let me persuade you to go with us and desist from any further pursuit. Nay, quoth Jack, were there twenty, not one should escape my fury. But when I have finished my task, I will come and pay my respects to you. Jack had not ridden more than a mile and a half when the cave mentioned by the knight appeared to view, near the entrance of which be beheld the giant sitting upon a block of timber with a knotted iron club by his side, waiting, as he supposed, for his brother's return with his prey. His goggle eyes were like flames of fire, his face grim and ugly, his cheeks like a couple of large flitches of bacon, while the bristles of his beard resembled rods of iron wire, and the locks that hung down upon his brawny shoulders were like curled snakes or hissing adders. Jack alighted from his horse and, putting on the coat of darkness, approached near the giant and said softly, Oh, are you there? It will not be long, ere I shall take you fast by the beard. The giant all this while could not see him on account of his invisible coat, so that Jack, coming up close to the monster, struck a blow with his sword at his head, but missing his aim, he cut off the nose instead. At this, the giant roared like claps of thunder and began to lay about him with his iron club like one stark mad. But Jack, running behind, drove his sword up to the hilt of the giant's back, which caused him to fall down dead. This done, Jack cut off the giant's head and sent it with his brother's head also to King Arthur by a wagoner he hired for that purpose. Jack now resolved to enter the giant's cave in search of the treasure, and passing along through a great many windings and turnings, he came at length to a large room paved with free stone, at the upper end of which was a boiling cauldron, and on the right hand a large table at which the giants used to dine. Then he came to a window, barred with iron, through which he looked and beheld a vast crowd of unhappy captives, who, seeing him, cried out, Alas, young man, art thou come to be amongst us in this miserable den? I, quoth Jack, but pray tell me why is it you are so imprisoned? We are kept here, said one, till such times as the giants have a wish to feast, and then the fattest among us is killed. And many are the times they have dined upon murdered men. Say you so, quoth Jack, and straight away unlocked the gate and let them free, who all rejoiced like condemned men at the sight of reprieve. Then, searching the giant's coffers, he sared the gold and silver amongst them. It was about sunrise the next day when Jack, after seeing the captives on their way to their homes, mounted his horse to go on his journey, and, by the help of his directions, reached the knight's house about noon. He was received here with all the signs of joy by the knight and his lady, who, in respect to Jack, prepared a feast which lasted many days, and all the gentry in the neighborhood being of the company. The worthy knight was likewise pleased to present him with a beautiful ring, on which was engraved a picture of the giant 
dragging the distressed knight and his lady with this motto. We are in sad distress, you see, under a giant's fierce command, but gain our lives and liberty by valiant Jack's victorious hand. But in the midst of all this mirth, a messenger brought the dismissal tidings that one Thunderdell, a giant with two heads, having heard of the death of his two kinsmen, came from the northern dales to be revenged on Jack, and was within a mile of the knight's seat, the country people flying before him like chaff. But Jack was no whit daunted and said, Let him come! I have a tool to pick his teeth. And you, ladies and gentlemen, walk but forth into the garden, and you shall witness this giant Thunderdell's death and destruction. The house of this knight was in the midst of a small island with a moat thirty feet deep and twenty feet wide around it, over which laid a drawbridge. Wherefore, Jack employed men to cut through this bridge on both sides, nearly to the middle. And then, dressing himself in his invisible cloak, he marched against the giant with his sword of sharpness. Although the giant could not see Jack, he smelled his approach and cried out in these words, Be, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive, or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Sayest thou so, said Jack, then thou art a monstrous miller indeed. At which the giant cried out again, Art thou that villain who killed my kinsman? Then I will tear thee with my teeth, suck thy blood, and grind thy bones to powder. You will catch me first, quoth Jack, and throwing off his invisible cloak, so that the giant might see him, and putting on his shoes of swiftness, he ran from the giant, who followed like a walking castle, so that the earth very seemed to shake at every step. Jack led him a long distance in order that the knights and ladies might see, and at last, to the end of the matter, ran lightly over the drawbridge, the giant, in full speed, pursuing him with his club. Then, coming to the middle of the bridge, the giant's great weight broke it down, and he tumbled, head standing by the moat, long into the water, where he rolled and wallowed like a whale. Jack, standing by the moat, laughed at him all the while. But though the giant foamed to hear him scoff and plunged from place to place in the moat, yet he could not get out to be revenged. Jack at length got a cart rope and cast it over the two heads of the giant and drew him ashore by a team of horses and then cut off both his heads with his sword of sharpness and sent them to King Arthur. After some time spent in mirth and pastime, Jack, taking leave of the knights and ladies, set out for new adventures. Though many woods he passed and came at length to the foot of a high mountain. Here, late at night, he found a lonesome house, and knocked at the door, which was opened by an ancient man with a head as white as snow. Father, said Jack, have you any place where a traveler may rest that he lost his way? Yes, said the old man. You are right welcome to my poor cottage. Whereupon Jack entered and down they sat together and the old man began to speak as follows. Son, I know you are the great conqueror of giants and behold my son, 
on the top of this mountain is an enchanted castle kept by a giant named Galagantus, who, by the help of an old conjurer, betrays knights and ladies into his castle, where, by magic art, they are transformed into many shapes and forms. But, above all, I weep for the fate of a duke's daughter, whom they fetched from her father's garden, carrying her through the air in a burning chariot drawn by fiery dragons. When they shut her up within the castle and transformed her into the shape of a white hind. And though many knights have tried to break the enchantment and set her free, yet no one could do it on account of two dreadful griffins which are placed at the castle gate and which destroy everyone who comes near. But you, my son, having an invisible coat, may pass by them unseen. Where on the gates of the castle you will find, written in large letters, by what means the enchantment may be broken. The old man having ended, Jack gave him his hand and promised that in the morning he would venture his life to free the lady. In the morning, Jack arose and put on his invisible coat and magic cap and shoes and prepared himself for the task. Now, when he had reached the top of the mountain, he soon saw two fiery griffins, but passed them without fear, because of his invisible coat. When he had got beyond them, he found upon the gates of the castle a golden trumpet, hung by a silver chain, under which these lines were written, Whosoever this trumpet shall blow shall soon the giant overthrow and break the black enchantment straight, so all shall be in happy state. Jack had no sooner read this, but he blew the trumpet, at which the castle trembled to its vast foundations, and the giant conjurer were in horrid fear, biting their thumbs and tearing their hair knowing their wicked way was at an end. Then the giant, stooping to take up his club, Jack at one blow cut off his head, whereupon the conjurer, mounting up into the air, was carried away in a whirlwind. Thus was the enchantment broken, and all the lords and ladies who had so long been transformed into birds and beasts, returned to their proper shapes, and the castle vanished away in a cloud of smoke. As a reward for his services, the king gave Jack the duke's daughter in marriage, and the whole kingdom was filled with joy at the wedding, and he and his lady lived in great joy and happiness all the rest of their days.